So last week, Pastor Mark began this three-week series called Blueprint, and the idea is that as we launch into Henry James in just two weeks, we want to know what our blueprint is. We want to know what is the approach that Valley Simsbury is taking to glorify God in this world. Last week, we talked about being together as a unit. Today, we're going to be talking about our mission. What are we supposed to be doing with this body and with the rest of the world? So I'm going to start by asking you a couple of questions. Now, again, I know you're 400 yards away, but if you could shout out with confidence the answer, I'll know at least that you heard the question. And of course, you have to take the risk of uh, whether or not you're right. But the first one is a gimme, all right? It's easy. And here it is. You have to just give me the last word in this sentence. Jesus was sent from heaven to earth. All right, you got it. Excellent. And you know that most Sunday school questions begin with Jesus, right? So I was no different. All right, now we're getting a little more into the details of the Old Testament. But these are words and main names that I think you'll recognize. Noah was sent from dry land to the ark. Somebody was brave enough to say it. Thank you, whoever that was. Yes, Noah was sent to his ark. Another familiar name from the Old Testament. Joseph. Joseph was sent from his father's sheep ranch to the country of Egypt. All right. You guys are really getting into this. Last one from the Bible, anyway. Moses was sent from the Midian desert to Pharaoh's court. That's where he was sent. God showed up through a burning bush. You know the story and said, go and talk to Pharaoh. And after he worked through 100 different excuses that Moses gave him, that's what Moses did. Now, here's two more, just two more, I promise. But these are in the current context, who we are as Valley Church. The first, Fred and Cassandra O'Brien were sent by Valley Church to, all right, a couple of you know who the O'Briens are, and yes, they used to be uh, members of Valley Avon, and about a dozen years ago, Valley Avon sent them to Dominican Republic, and they're still there, not because they have to be, but because they want to be, because they know that's where God has sent them. And then last, but certainly not least, Mark and Janet Woof were sent by Valley Church Avon to Valley Church. All right, you all got that one. Ended with a flourish. Absolutely. And are we glad that Valley Church Avon sent Mark and Janet? Absolutely we are. They are our spiritual leaders. And we are glad for that. So why am I asking these questions? Well, it's because in our blueprint as a church, we say that we are on mission, and that word could mean a lot of things as you listen to it and think about it, but what we really want you to understand is that when we say that we're on mission, it means that we're sent. If you dig a little bit into the meaning of the word mission in Scripture, it's talking about being sent. It's not necessarily being sent overseas. That might happen. It happened to the O'Briens. But that's not what it really means. What it means is that every one of us, everyone, should have a sense of where they're being sent. And again, it doesn't mean that you have to move from Simsbury to Avon or to make some sort of a local geographical adjustment. 
It means having a sense of where God wants you to be his representative, where he wants you to glorify his name, especially amongst the many, many people in our area who know nothing of Jesus Christ. Yeah, they know the name. Yeah, they know that there are churches, but there's no relevance in their life. Those are the people that we are most concerned about. There are other ways to be sent, and you can be sent into service and teach Sunday school and so forth. That's all good. But something that we want to together understand as a congregation is that we are sent somewhere to people who don't know Jesus. This is the model for mission. And a good friend of mine named Marvin Newell wrote a wonderful book called Commissioned, and I am gladly giving Marvin credit for most of this information because it fits right in with what we want you to understand is our blueprint for ministry. And if you've been here since we were meeting up in the Mill Pond parking lot, and still don't get this, here's a chance to hear it again. If this is your first Sunday here, I uh, saw that there was a new family and we're so glad you're trying us out, checking us out. Well, this is who we are. This is a great Sunday to decide, hey, do I want to be in this place or is this a, you know, something, uh, it's just going to be a, a one and done kind of situation. We hope that you'll stick around and you'll do it with information if you'll just understand this message about being sent. So I'm going to take some uh, observations from John 20, 19 to 22. If you have a Bible available, you might want to look at those verses, but I will read them to you, okay? This is John 20, 19 to 22. This is a story of Jesus encountering his disciples very shortly after his crucifixion and resurrection. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then his disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, this is our line, so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This little passage contains the Gospel of John version of the Great Commission. Most of you understand that there are some verses in Scripture that capture what God wants us to do. It's his great commission. And there happen to be great commission statements in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke. There's one here in John that I just read. There's one in Acts. And there's a couple in the Old Testament. So this is not just some random thought that, you know, God hopes we pick up on in the midst of thousands of other words in the Bible. No, this is one of five, six, seven different statements of the Great Commission in Scripture. And this one in particular describes the model for the Great Commission. How is it going to work? The way it's going to work, as Jesus told his disciples, is that God sent me to earth. That was the first question in our quiz, remember? And he said, now, now I'm sending you. And can you imagine what those Men might have been thinking, where were they? They were locked up in a room. They didn't want to be discovered. They were afraid that there would be guilt by association. They knew Jesus, so maybe they'd suffer the same fate that Jesus had suffered. They didn't want any part of it. They were human beings. They were locked up and full of fear. And then what does Jesus do? The first thing he does is establish the fact that indeed it was him. Because yes, some folks had gone to the grave and came running back and said, Jesus is arisen, but not everybody was buying it. 
not everybody was ready to stake their life on it. So he, the scripture says, he, he, he showed him his, his side. He, he showed him where he had been pierced with his, with his sword. He showed him his, his, his hands and his wrists that had been nailed. And once they saw that, woo, were they happy to see it. Were they so glad? Were they so glad to know that not only was this Jesus, but in fact, he was resurrected. This was him. So having established that, then Jesus says, peace with you, receive the Holy Spirit. So let's look in a little more detail. The first thing that I want us to notice is that fear does not exempt us from being sent. Were the disciples afraid? Absolutely they were. And for good reason, as I said. They were locked up in a room. They didn't want anybody to know who they were and where they were. They were fearful. And as we talk about being sent, I am sure that some of you are responding internally by saying, me? Hey, wait a minute, me? Ah, uh, that's not me. I mean, sure, I can see Pastor Mark and Janet and they're sent and maybe some folks in your, uh, your acquaintance here at the church. Okay, they're sent, but me, I'm going to be sent? It freaks you out. It makes you scared. And if that's the case, I am only here to encourage you. It's a completely natural reaction. Now, one of the places that we might be sent is our neighborhood. And I feel that to a certain degree. And uh, one day, my neighbor, whose name is Tarek, unusual name because he's Pakistani, he came to me and said, Doug, I'm having an end of Ramadan party. Won't you come? He was a Muslim. Ramadan's the month of prayer and fasting. And uh, of course, they have a celebration at the end. And you know what my first reaction was? I didn't say anything. Me? You want me to go to a Ramadan party with a bunch of Muslims? That's what I was thinking. And then some of you know my wife, Christine. She is so sweet. She's so gentle. She's so kind. When Christine heard of my trepidation, she poked me in the ribs and said, Doug, do you want to win Tarek to Christ or don't you? Well, that's all it took. With the proverbial gun in my back, I said to Tarek, of course I'll be at your party. So we go to the party. Initially, again, i am got my misgivings, but I'm there. The first thing that happens is Christine goes on one floor and I go on another. The women are upstairs, the men are downstairs. I sort of expected that, but it was still a little disheartening to see the love of my life departing me in my moment of fear. So we have our meal. Men are separate from women. And Tarek, the male host, he gathers us together. And he says, uh, it's been a great meal, folks, and it was wonderful being a Ramadan, but I just want to hear from one of our guests. Now, there were two North Americans in the room, me and this other guy. Everybody else was from Pakistan or someplace in Asia. And the other North American gets up and he gives his spiritual story. He says, you know, I used to go to a Baptist church, but that just didn't work for me. Then, then I saw the truth of Islam and I have been so happy as a Muslim. You know what Tarek had done? He set me up. He knew I was a Baptist pastor. And he happened to know this guy who had been in a Baptist church. Now, I could tell by the way this guy was talking, he was not a follower of Jesus. But regardless, the point was clear. Baptists do become Muslims. And Doug, how about you? Well, everybody in the room sort of faded away shortly after that, except for Tarek's dad. So Tarek's dad came over and he gave me this 15-minute lecture on how Jesus 
is received with joy by the Muslim faith. Now, again, I know enough about uh, Jesus and about Islam that I, I knew that uh, this wasn't going anywhere because Muslims don't believe that Jesus is the son of God. And the party slowly wound down. Well, that's my illustration about fear. But there is a little bit of upside to me being the miserable, lack of courage kind of guy that I am. What happened was Tarek was moving. He came over, said goodbye. And I thought, man, this is my last shot. So I said to Tarek, Tarek, you are such a good Muslim, so faithful to your religion. Are you going to paradise? That's their word for heaven. And he immediately responded by saying, oh, Doug, there's no way I can know I'm going to heaven. I, I, I just don't know if I'm good enough. And then I responded and said, you know, Tarek, I do know I'm going to paradise. And it's not because of something I've done. It's because of something that Jesus did for me and for all of us. Now, I wish I could tell you Tarek prayed to receive Christ that night, but no, he did not. But at least I had the opportunity to share the gospel. And I'm not suggesting that every time you do something that involves a little bit of fear that you're going to have some story to tell like I've just shared. But the point is, we have nothing to fear in being sent when we are serving the God of the universe. Furthermore, the scripture tells us that perfect love casts out fear. And furthermore from that, we're a congregation, we're a body. And if you're facing a situation where you're fearful, all you have to do is admit it. And people will pray with you, people will stand with you, people will find, ask you to tell, what, tell them what happened after you've gone through whatever that fearful experience happened to be. So please, don't dismiss being sent because of fear. The other thing I hope you'll catch from the scripture is that peace is possible when we're being sent. Twice, Jesus says, peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. Relax. Take it easy. This is the work of the Holy Spirit, and God happens to use all of us to be the vessels of the Holy Spirit. Now, what I'm saying today might be marginally upsetting to some of you, like I said, because all of a sudden, we're being told we all have this job to do, like 100% of us, and that's going to make some of you nervous or dismissive. But I want to tell you how radical this was for these Disciples, all of whom were Jewish. Because what they were used to was a plan for salvation, essentially coming out of the Old Testament, where Israel was the messenger for the gospel. And the idea was, if Israel is this model nation, successful, spiritually fulfilled, then people from other nations were going to notice. And it would be the nation of Israel that would draw people to find out about God. There's a story in, in Kings, that First Kings, that illustrates this perfectly. You ever hear of the Queen of Sheba? You may or may not, but she was a real person. And as far as we can tell, she was from the country of Yemen. Yemen, not Israel. But you know what? she heard somehow about Solomon, the king, and she heard about his God. So what did Sheba do? She traveled to Israel. Israel was the drawing point for her. She wanted to find out what was behind this incredibly wise man and the God that he served. And so the scriptures tell us, 1 Kings 10.1, now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, Concerning the name of the Lord, she came. She came. That was the plan. And now, these Jewish disciples who grew up with that assumption, yeah, Israel's 
attractive enough, then we're going to draw some people in and we'll see some people become fearful and honoring of God. They go from that mindset to Jesus, the center of their movement, coming and saying, wait a minute, we're not doing it that way anymore. I am sending you. My father sent me. That's what it took to save this world. I had to come down from heaven. And now you guys are going to go out. And in Acts, we find out it wasn't just to Jerusalem. It wasn't just to where they lived. It was Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. It was the whole package. It was the whole world. Can you imagine the shock that these disciples experienced when they were told this? But Jesus also told them that they would receive the Holy Spirit. And so what happens in Acts, the very next book after John, where we start hearing stories of the early church, and we're only into Acts 2, when Peter gives this incredible spirit-filled sermon, and 3,000 people come to Christ. Do you know how many followers of Jesus there were? when Jesus showed up in that room where the disciples had locked themselves up, at best, there were about 100 people. Just think of that. There's more or less 100 people right out there. Again, I can't see you, but I know you're there. And just suppose that this is it. There's no Valley Avon. There's no, the, no Barn Presbyterian Church. There's no Wintonberry. There's nothing except us. And there's the whole rest of the world. That was the perspective that we've got to appreciate. But things happened quickly. As I said, 3,000 people came to Christ through the Pentecost experience of Peter's preaching. And uh, as we understand history and the movement of Christianity, the fact is, by the time Revelation was written, that was about 90 AD, about 60 years after uh, this meeting that Jesus had in the room, by that time, there were about 8,000 followers of Jesus. And on and on it went until what do we got today? We've got one third of the world, of the 8 billion people in the world that recognize Christianity in some form. That's a story. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. So the question is, where are you sent? And what are you being sent into? It's no secret, but I'm going to put a little flesh on it, that it's a tough world out there. It's a disinterested world out there. Most people, especially in our area, where they've got three meals a day and a roof over their head and one of the best school systems in the state for their kids, there's not much need for Jesus. People think they've got it together. People even think that there's no need for God. I came across a full-page ad in the Hartford Current about a month ago, and the title of the advertisement was, I'm Secular and I Vote. And this was not a political advertisement for some candidate. It was a lady who was an atheist who is encouraging membership in something called the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Now, I think all of us believe in freedom of religion. Great idea. May it long live. But this is the Freedom From Religion Foundation. I, you know, I knew that atheists are growing in this country. But I didn't know they were like marketing, you know? I didn't know they were advertising. Hey, come on, join our group. But that was the purpose of this ad. The ad said that 29% of the country is already atheist, 29%. And they had an authoritative source for that statistic. I remember mm, 15 years ago when that number was closer to 17%. Well, if you consider that going from 17 to 29% of the congregation in the space of a dozen or so years, that makes atheism as the fastest growing belief system, if you will, in our country. We need to recognize that, but we also need to recognize 
that the Holy Spirit is powerful. And that if each of us determines where we're sent, we can change that. We can change that as we bring people into personal relationship with Jesus through the actions of our witness and in time, the words of our witness. That's what I hope you'll get from this message. So, where are you sent? Where are you sent? That's the point of my message this morning. I'm going to suggest four different possibilities. And please understand, I'm not suggesting that every one of you should be sent to every one of these places. It will never go well if you feel bifurcated in every different direction. But I'm saying these points of reference to suggest that maybe there's a place within one of these points that's the place of your being sent. These are all P words. I got them out of a book. You know, it's got to be alliterative. So porch is the first place where you might be sent. What's the porch? Well, that's pretty obvious. It's, it's where you locally live. It's your neighborhood. And I know we often talk about neighbors, but don't think you have to be sent to your neighborhood. It might not work for one reason or another, but it's certainly a place to consider. And I would say that Christine and I, we feel sent to our neighborhood, but it's not our major focus, okay? We do function as good neighbors and we pray for our neighbors and we try to share as I illustrated earlier, but that's not the only place. It's not the major place for my wife and I. I'm just saying that to help you if you just feel automatic guilt that, oh, I haven't done anything with my neighbors. I don't know their names. I don't know what they do. If that's your reaction, well, just think it through. Maybe you're not sent there, but maybe you are. And the thing is, you, you do have a choice because you can connect with your neighbors. You can do things to interact with them or you can ignore them. I mean, we all know neighbors, I think, at least if you live like in the suburban development, like we always have. We see people who drive into their driveway, push the button, the garage door goes up, they go in, the garage goes, goes, goes down. And that's what we see at seven o'clock at night. And if we're up and around at 7 a.m. in the morning, we see the garage door go up, the car comes out, and whoever drives to wherever, we don't know. That's the relationship that's quite possible with our neighbors. But it doesn't have to be that way. And uh, I've found that, first of all, I want to at least know their names. And when I've heard their name, I run around the corner and I write it down. My memory for names is no better than yours. And now that, that names, those names have become a prayer list. And they're what I call my focus on five, except there's more than five. These are people that I'm praying for by name that something will happen in their lives for the gospel. I offer to help my neighbors. That's easy for me. I'm a very task-oriented guy. I love getting sweaty and dirty and helping somebody out. But then sometimes I've offered pretty significant service to my neighbors and they've said, hey, got it. In other words, we don't need you. I don't like that. But that's part of serving. Sometimes you get to do it. Sometimes you don't. Holidays, in my neighborhood at least, which is 80% Asian, to have a Christmas open house is kind of a curiosity. And we've done that fairly well for a number of years with the support of another uh, Christian couple who live about a half mile away. So these are all possibilities for connecting with your porch. But again, I'm not suggesting that's the only place you could be sent. How about pathways? These are places where we interact with people. These are people we, we travel with, we connect with on a regular basis. You know, in two weeks, we're going to Henry James. There's always going to be a paid facilities person from the school on duty while we are there. Wouldn't it be good if we didn't just treat that person as invisible, as just some person that's kind of standing there in the background? Wouldn't it be good if you asked a question or two and maybe over time got to know the names of 
of their kids if they're married and if, uh, you know, whatever their circumstances are. That's a way of noticing people on the pathway. Pivot points. Pivot points are places where we make a turn. Nothing too creative there. But where do you make a turn? You make a turn maybe with your kids' sports teams. You make a turn with uh, a bunch of people you get together with to, to play cards. You, you make a turn at the coffee shop where you show up every weekday morning to, to buy coffee. Whatever it is, there are these places where we know we're going to be, and so we evaluate whether or not we're sent. I had a friend, actually wrote a, another book that I read, and he did a lot of air travel. Some of you might do that. And you know what this guy did? He always signed up for the middle seat. Now, I'm an experienced traveler. I never take the middle seat if I can get away with it. Never. But this guy explained, if I sit in the middle seat, my chances of meaningful conversations on the plane are doubled. This man felt sent to the middle seat. I never have, frankly. But it's just another example. And finally, there are programs. Programs are activities that are offered to meet needs. Because only when people are needy do they become interested in the gospel. Very few who have no sense of need have an interest in the gospel. So we have programs. We have divorce care here on Monday nights starting next month. Avon Campus has Celebrate Recovery. Avon Campus this afternoon has a workshop for people who have lost a spouse. Christine has a nurse friend that she worked with for years. Now she lost her husband a couple months ago. We went to the funeral. Christine's been at our house a bunch of times. They've actually had spiritual con uh, conversation because the wife wonders, where's my husband? Is he in heaven? She, she's not sure. And they've had conversations about this. Now this afternoon, Christine and this woman are going together to hear about how to deal with the loss of a spouse. So these are just program possibilities that we might consider. The point is, you're not going to be, be sent to every one of those P's but you're not going to be sent to none of them. Okay, understand this. If you have a relationship with Christ, if you're going to be part of this tight-knit family, this group that loves to get together in small groups and in meals after services and all that, if you're going to be part of us, understand that we hope you'll think through what it means to be sent. And if you're just conflicted as could be about this, then please talk about it with us uh, personally. We want to help you to know where you're sent. And I'm going to close with just two things that uh, my efforts to be sent over a long period of time have taught me. The first thing I want you to know is that you'll never influence people you don't like. And if you think you're sent to your office and you can't stand anybody in the office, you hate your boss, well, that's probably not the place where you're going to have an influence. Now, there are certain elements of integrity there. That, you know, you need to show up on time. You need to get your work done. You need to show a positive attitude. You can do all that without being sent. But you must know somebody without Jesus who you like. And that's where I'd say you're sent. I've been in Christian work like my whole life. I was committed to Christ when I was in junior high school. I've never known what it is to hang out with unchurched people. And so you say unchurched, I say, I'm going someplace else. But that's not the idea. And believe it or not, even introverted, task-oriented Pastor Doug has found a couple of unchurched people out there that he actually likes. And those are the people that I'm sent to. 
So please understand that there are people out there who you not only are being sent to, but there are people that you like. You don't want to see them go down the wrong path spiritually. And so you're sent to them. And finally, this is pretty critical. You only repeat doing what you're good at. You only repeat doing what you're good at. And one of the biggest frustrations for me as I developed my Christian life was that I wanted to win everybody to Christ. The problem, I mean, that sounds maybe, you know, admirable in certain respects, but it's really just part of my dysfunction. You see, I am obsessive compulsive when it comes to achievement. I just have to get things done. I've never figured out why, but there's enough people around me that have tolerated it all these years, so I keep going. I had to adjust my definition of evangelism. Of course, this made it a whole lot more biblical than the idea of, I got to reach everybody for Christ. And instead, now, it's, I need to represent Christ wherever I am. And I need to be discerning about whether I do that by words or actions. That has become an acceptable definition to me. Something I heard once, but I need to remember it, is that we are called to be a witness for Christ, not a lawyer. Okay, the Holy Spirit is the one who wins the case. He's the one who's working in people's lives. We're the ones who are the physical representation of the gospel to the people to whom we're sent. So when I came to that realization, I had uh, recently watched the movie Rocky. Now, Rocky 1 was pretty good. Rocky 14, I'm not so sure. But Rocky 1, back in the 90s, had a scene where the boxer Rocky was anticipating fighting Apollo Creed, the champion. And what did Rocky say? Rocky said, I just want to go the distance. That's my perspective on being sent. I want to be sent until the day that I die. And I'm closer to dying than most of you guys are. That's what I want to do. I'm going to go to the grave with my evangelistic boots on. How about you?